World War II was a period of unprecedented technological advancement, and artillery was no exception. These five innovations were not just incremental improvements, but fundamental changes in how artillery was designed, produced, and used. The proximity fuse was one of the most important technological breakthroughs of World War II. Britain had experimented with photoelectric and acoustic fuses in the 1930s, but the decisive step came when the radio proximity concept was shared with the U.S. during the 1940 Tizard mission. The U.S. National Defense Research Committee assigned the work to Section T, led by physicist Merle Toof. The project involved more than 40 contractors, and its details remained classified until 1954. The fuse miniaturized a continuous wave radar into a shell's nose, using an autodyne circuit and a single vacuum tube that acted as both transmitter and receiver. The artillery shell's body serves as antenna, power supplied by a brake glass battery that was activated after firing. As the projectile approached a target, the reflected radio waves would interfere with the oscillator signal. When interference exceeded a threshold, then the gas-filled thyrotron would activate the detonator. The system must endure tens of thousands of Gs in acceleration and significant centrifugal forces of spin until impact. The proximity fuse increased anti-aircraft guns' effectiveness by 5 to 10 times and fired by the USS Helena in January 1943. In defending Britain against V-1 flying bombs, kill rates using proximity fuse shells rose from 24% to 79% in just two months. In the Pacific, it proved invaluable against Japanese aircraft and kamikazes. Originally restricted from land use to prevent capture, it was first employed in ground combat during the Battle of the Bulge, where airburst artillery devastated enemy infantry. General Patton claimed the proximity fuse won the battle. By reducing wasted fire, improving accuracy, and forcing tactical changes on the enemy, the VT fuse accelerated Allied victory and shaped post-war artillery design. Although self-propelled guns existed before World War II, the war marked the first large-scale standardization and mass production of artillery on tank chassis. This innovation solved the problem of towed artillery that often lagged behind fast-moving armored units. Self-propelled guns could keep pace with tanks and motorized infantry, move cross-country, and rapidly shoot and scoot to avoid counter-battery fire. Their mobility gave armored divisions faster response times, more continuous fire support, and the ability to exploit breakthroughs before the enemy regrouped. Mounting guns on existing tank chassis helped to streamline production, supply chains, and maintenance. The American M7 Priest carried a 105mm howitzer on M3 Lee and Sherman chassis, while Germany fielded the 150mm Hummel on a Panzer III and IV hybrid design. The most prolific was the Stug III, which was built on the Panzer III chassis. It served as assault gun, tank destroyer, and light artillery support. Shortages of Panzer III hulls led to the development of Stug IV based on Panzer IV chassis. Lighter designs included the Grimmel based on Panzer 38T. The Soviet US-276 was prized for its simplicity and low cost. Casement layouts and fixed superstructure kept Soviet SPGs cheaper and easier to mass produce, though they had limited traverse performance. Although ammunition storage of self-propelled guns was often restricted, they transformed ground combat by combining firepower with mobility. The Allies and Soviets produced over 227,000 tanks and SPGs. They reduced manpower needs, eased logistics, and offered crews protection. Capable of both direct and indirect fire, self-propelled guns supported offensive thrusts and reinforced defenses quickly. Their success influenced post-war doctrine, which laid the foundation for modern self-propelled artillery systems. The Fire Direction Center was a World War II organizational and computational innovation that transformed artillery into a battalion-level weapon. It was developed in the 1930s at the U.S. Field Artillery School, Fort Sill, under Carlos Brewer. All planning and calculation tasks, such as firing range, azimuth, elevation, propellant type, temperature, weather, and altitude, were calculated in one place. This allowed rapid shifts of fire and the ability to mass several batteries on a single target. Using graphical firing tables, Fire Direction Center reduced computational errors and response time. By 1941, every U.S. artillery battalion had a Fire Direction Center, 
with wild divisional and core level centers allowed coordination of dozens of battalions. Fire Direction Center not only increased firepower flexibility, but also improved safety by verifying gun positions and reducing friendly fire. One of the most decisive tactics made possible was the Time on Target Barrage, pioneered by the British in North Africa. It ensured shells from multiple batteries arrived simultaneously to deny defenders time to take cover. Fire Direction Center computed time of flight for each gun and synchronized clocks ensured accuracy. Batteries then fired very precisely in staggered manner so all impacts coincided. It demanded strict timeline discipline and standardized procedures which pushed many improvements in communication and gunnery practice. At Elsinbourne Ridge during the Battle of the Bulge, massed fire from three divisions or 129 guns was coordinated through one fire direction center. By war's end, up to 60% of enemy casualties inflicted by U.S. forces came from artillery. The Fire Direction Center ensured Allied battlefield dominance and shaped modern fire control doctrine. World War II transformed rockets from old curiosities into powerful mass-effect weapons. Unlike traditional tube artillery, Soviet and German systems delivered devastating salvos in seconds that prioritized volume over precision. The Soviet BM-13 Katusha was mass-produced after 1941 in over 200 factories. By war's end, nearly 10,000 launchers were built, mounted on trucks such as the ZIS-6 or Lend-Lease Studenbaker. The German Nebelwerfer 41 was a 6-barrel 15mm launcher. Later models included heavier 28 or 32cm versions, and mobile systems like the Panzerwerfer 42 was based on half-tracks. German rockets typically carried 30 to 50 kilogram warheads inside welded casing to speed up production. Accuracy was generally low, although improved somewhat by fin or spin stabilization. Soviet doctrine emphasized saturation, with a battery of four BM-13s delivered over four tons of explosives across a designated area. Regimental level rocket artillery might concentrate thousands of rockets for decisive barrages. German tactics placed Nebelwerfers closer to the front to support infantry or sealed defensive sectors. Because smoke and flame made them easy to spot, mobility was critical. The Nebelwerfer's howling salvo earned the nickname Moaning Mini, while the Katusha's shrieking roar was called Stalin's organ. Troops often mistook barrages for airstrikes due to the noise and destruction. Rocket artillery's strengths were speed, volume, and psychological impact. Its weaknesses, such as slow reloads and inaccuracy, were offset by salvo size and mobility. Soviet Guards mortar units centralized production and deployment, ensuring priority in offensives. With thousands of Katusha launchers and millions of rockets were produced, they were central to Red Army breakthroughs. The success of Katusha's and Nebelwerfer's shaped post-war multiple rocket launcher systems, which established massed rocket fire as a defining feature of modern artillery. World War II pushed artillery to unprecedented extremes. While World War I had seen long-range guns like the German Paris gun, its successors, such as the Schweirer Gustav and Dora railway guns, represented a new scale in size and destructive power. Built by Krupp in the late 1930s, the 800mm Schweirer Gustav weighed 1,350 tons when assembled, making it the heaviest mobile artillery piece ever deployed. Its shells weighed 7.1 tons and could reach 47 kilometers, with the concrete piercing type could penetrate up to 7 meters of reinforced concrete. Intended to break through fortresses like the Maginot Line, it instead saw limited use on the Eastern Front. Most famously, it was deployed during the 1942 Siege of Sevastopol, where it destroyed numerous bunkers and underground depots. Operating Gustav was an enormous undertaking. Components were transported by 30 rail cars, which required special locomotives, reinforced tracks, and a dedicated spur line. Site preparation took weeks and thousands of workers. The assembly alone required 250 men and 54 hours to complete. Full operations involved 4,500 personnel. Ammunition handling was slow, with cranes hoisting multi-ton shells and separate propellant charges. Rate of fire rarely exceeded one round every 30 minutes. Barrel wear was severe, and after only 48 shots at Sevastopol, Gustav's first barrel needed relining. The gun was guarded by entire anti-aircraft battalions due to its vulnerability. 
Despite its scale, Gustav's tactical value was minimal. Immobile, conspicuous, and slow to employ, it was only effective against fixed targets, and other targets often shifted before it could fire. Air power and more mobile artillery proved far more flexible. As a result, these extremely heavy guns became military dead ends. They were impressive feats of engineering but strategically inefficient compared to aircraft and more mobile artillery.